Hello, everyone. We'll get started in just another moment. All right, let's go ahead and kick things off. Um, we are uh, back this week uh, to talk and continue our series on uh, the global benchmarking webinar series that looked at the study tour that looked at pedestrian safety on urban arterials. So last week, uh, you may have joined us for part one of really introduction to the study and the overview of the findings. Today, we're diving in with part two to the movement in place framework, uh, a topic that uh, you heard about a little bit last week. We hope by the end of today, you'll be an expert of sorts on this topic, or at least uh, know how to share this information with your colleagues. Um, I'm joined today by a, a panel, um, some of uh, some familiar faces and some new ones. So let me introduce them to you now before I cover a little bit of housekeeping uh, items. Um, first, we're um, we're joined again by Jonah Chiarenza, who is a community planner at the US DOT Volpe National Transportation Systems Center, uh, where he develops strategies for a national policy, uh, conducts research, and disseminates information about best practices and design solutions for local and regional transportation challenges. Uh, we're also joined by Wayne Sharplin, who's the senior advisor of the One Network Framework within the Waka Katahi New Zealand Transport Agency. His career in the transport industry spans over 11 years uh, with experience in movement and place frameworks, operations planning, emergency management, public communications, stakeholder engagement, and maintenance and operations. So uh, welcome, Wayne. And we're also joined by Andrew McGill, uh, who's head of the Integrated Network Planning at Auckland Transport, where he leads the team responsible for transport strategies, policies, and plans across all modes for the Auckland region. Andrew is a transport planner who has worked in private and public sectors across multiple jurisdictions in Australia and New Zealand, working from strategic planning through to delivery and operations. So delighted to have a panel of, of experts here today to share their work with you. I only have a couple of other things to announce um, or share with you outside the main topic here. Just a bit of housekeeping. Uh, you can, again, submit questions to us. You can do that throughout the webinar. Questions and comments, um, send them when you have them. We will hold about 30 minutes at the end to discuss those with our panelists today. We've uh, been archiving this series at pedbikeinfo.org slash webinars. You can jump to this page where we've uh, already placed the archive material for part one. If you missed that one, please go back and review that. Uh, we've got the slides posted already for uh, part two today. And we'll continue to update with recordings for the series as we go along. You'll get an email later today with information about uh, professional development hours for the webinar, how you can complete a post-webinar survey to get your certificate of attendance, where you can find a lot of the resources and reports linked to that we mentioned here in the webinar series. Uh, and you can sign up for future episodes, parts three and four, if you haven't done so already. Let me give you a, a look here at the schedule. Um, you'll see in the top left, part one, we handled that last week. We've moved on to part two on the movement in place framework. And after today, uh, later in the month and then next month, we'll have sessions on both the safe system approach to road safety audits, as well as speed management policies and practices. So we hope you'll join us for those as well. Um, we'll have discussion at the end. At this point, I would like to turn things over to uh, Jonah Chiarenza to go ahead and get us started. Jonah? Great, thank you very much. Um, can you hear me okay? Yes, I can. Great. Uh, so I'm gonna go through some slides um, pretty quickly. And um, as Dan mentioned, the slides are all posted already. So you can go grab stuff if you miss something. Don't feel like you have to take screenshots. Um, my goal is to try to get through quickly and, and get over to our uh, guests from the future. They're visiting us from tomorrow morning. It's amazing, um, Wayne and Andrew. And we thank them for getting up super early to join us from New Zealand. Um, so without further ado, let's get started. Um, so, you know, this is year one of a two year FHWA implementation period for the study. Uh, at the end of the presentation, we'll provide some updates on what else we have coming. So please stay tuned um, and stay connected to find other opportunities to learn and participate in bringing these findings to bear in the US. Please download and, and have the report with you. There's also um, a prior desk study that we did that looked at a, a lot of different countries before we down selected to Australia and New Zealand for our study tour. And there's some valuable information in there as well. So please check those out. Um, so we know we're doing poorly in the States. Australia and New Zealand are doing much better. The question is, how are they doing it? As you might expect, there's really no silver bullet. I mean, pedestrian safety is not solvable in isolation. 
Um, there's a, a complex system level failure happening in the US transportation system, and it requires a system level suite of solutions to address that. So that's what we're here to learn from Australia and New Zealand, these systematic solutions. Um, this uh, slide here, what's the problem with Strode's? So Strode's is a, a pejorative term. I believe it was coined by Chuck Marone, uh, Strong Towns, and it's basically a mashup of a street, which is a place or an environment where commerce and activity happens, um, and a road, which is a high-speed connection between places. And most arterials are Strode's in the States. They don't really function well as a street or a road. Um, the design and operation of many arterials emphasizes speed and traffic flow, but it also has commerce and access to goods and services. Um, and arterials that basically try to be all things to all people, um, sort of the, the worst case version of a complete street, if you will, they often end up failing at both. I mean, there are lousy places to be, they get really congested, um, and we see a lot of our crashes, serious injuries, and death happening on arterials. So, you know, Strode's pretty universally bad, but that doesn't mean that streets or roads are bad. Um, Well-planned and designed streets and roads um, serve different purposes, and both of them are important to society. So the trick is really knowing where to build what, and more to the point, once you figure that out, how do you get that done? This is where the framework of movement and place comes in. Uh, so here again is a sneaky QR code to the report. From the report, here's our kind of cut um, cut out uh, description. Movement in place helps practitioners take an objective and proactive approach to the ongoing evolution of the transportation network. These aren't problems that get solved overnight. They're systemic. We have to address the problem over time, the way um, we have projects that come about on our network can be controlled and influenced by movement in place so that incrementally we're seeing that transformation happening over time along a strategic plan. Um, the core principles in the report that we identified for movement in place are one, establishing a common basis for decision making uh, so that everybody's speaking the same language and kind of understands what the, where the goalposts are. We consider the role and capabilities of different modes on the network. And then we also coordinate the transformation of land use and transportation. As I said on the first webinar, this has to happen sort of in sequence using the forces of um, change that already make changes happen in land use and transportation. Some of those we have control over, some of those we don't, and we have to react to. Uh, here's a quote from the report. Again, download it. You'll, you'll find these and many more quotes. Um, Wayne is going to cover this slide as as well, so I will keep it brief, but the um, Waka Katahi's One Network Framework, which is their version of movement in place, really emphasizes this movement in place as a, an instrument for change. It's a mechanism for how we plan and design our transportation to change over time. Uh, so it considers place, the context of each segment of the network. It considers both the existing and the baseline, or the existing baseline conditions, and what we want those conditions to be in the future, and that's important, that establishes the delta that we want to address between existing conditions and future conditions. It classifies modal priorities at a network scale um, that says which parts of the network are which are most important for which modes. Um, and it's not just pet bike focus. We're thinking about general traffic. We're thinking about freight. Um, we're thinking about uh, public transit. Uh, and it leverages different modes for the efficient movement of goods and people, as opposed to focusing on single, single occupant vehicles um, in our transportation planning world. Um, this is another slide that Wayne will share. Um, but the question is, um, or the, the point of showing this is that movement in place um, has a component where you rank um, the existing conditions. How much movement significance do you have in a, pretend, in a, a segment of a corridor? And how much place significance do you have there? And what do you want to have in terms of movement significance and place significance? So you might have a place that's very congested and you want more movement um, and you need to figure out how to do that. You might have a place where you have um, new buildings um, or new, new plans in place to build you know, mixed denser uses. And therefore you're expecting more place to be in, in a location that currently doesn't have a lot of it. So where does that put you on this um, this matrix, and you have to think about um, not only what is it now and what do we want it to be in the future. Sometimes 
you'll actually change from one type of um, street classification to another. In other cases, the classification won't change, but you'll say that design that we have on the roadway right now is not actually fulfilling the needs um, that we have in this classification. So let's update the design to match that. Uh, so on our webinar number one, um, I said thinking about land use and transportation isn't a new thing. And then Mike King, who's one of the practitioners behind NACTO's first um, uh, urban street design guide and, and many other great um, products, called me out by name and referenced a 2007 paper called Link in Place that was new to me. So I had to go take a look at that. Um, and I went through it and read the abstract. Um, OK, tell me more. The, the guide introduces a new paradigm for designing and planning urban streets based on the principles of link and place. That sounds familiar. Um, streets are designed for people to get through, minimize travel time. OK, I got that. Uh, places, these are destinations, right? That's a nice way to think about it. People are encouraged to spend time there. OK, the guide presents an integrated approach to street planning, creating a street plan that defines the intended role of each street with the characteristics of a whole street network to guide the individual street design in accordance with the role in the street plan. All right, that's starting to sound a lot like establishing a network scale movement in place framework to guide individual project design decisions, which is what we're talking about today. And then, oh, the greatest challenges lie in traditional high streets, which combine high link status with high place status. So at this point, I was like, OK, yes, we have been talking about this for a while. Good call. Thank you, Mike. Um, and Mike's right. We have been talking about this for a long time. And if you look around, you know, there are plenty of examples of successful road diets or street redesigns that change the character of movement on a street to better match its context or place, the place that that street embodies. And Mike referenced ITE CNU, that's the Institute of Transportation Engineers and Congress for the New Urbanisms document, Designing Walkable Urban Thoroughfares, a Context Sensitive Approach. Um, from 2010, there's a follow up from 2017 implementing context sensitive design on multimodal thoroughfares. And these are really important gu guides for um, the transportation um, practitioners uh, world for implementing the strategy of why do we want to build what, where. And CNU developed this concept of, um, I think prior to this, the urban to rural transect. If you aren't a land use planner or you haven't been familiar with this, this is the idea of different place types um, and corresponding development patterns. So it's a very similar thing that's now been adapted into um, transportation to say, let's classify different parts of our environment, and then let's kind of have some a playbook to tell us what the right type of thing to put there is, and what should it look like? How should it operate? So this concept is helpful for land use planners contextualizing different densities or use types, um, building and urban design guidelines, um, architectural design guidelines for different areas of, of a community. And you know, new urbanism was and continues to be about there being more nuance and sort of increased options for development patterns than just sort of having central business district here, suburban bedroom community surrounding that, and then farmland surrounding that. I mean, it's not it's not that simple. There's a lot more nuance to it, and we can take advantage of that by naming and then describing what we want in those different areas. Um, and actually, Florida, which is one of the birthplaces of this idea of the transect, has seen this concept now adopted into their state's, um, the state DOT's context classification guide and their design manual. Um, it's one of several states taking this new approach. Um, I'll just show you briefly Florida's classification guide. It's a great example of operationalizing a movement and play style approach. So as you hear me go through a little bit more detail and then Wayne and um, Andrew get into some of the, the nitty gritty of how this works in Australia and New Zealand, um, don't think that, that it's not happening here. It, it is. We just want to um, make it happen more broadly. And so um, for your information, again, there's QR codes for a lot of these things. So you can zap that now or, or later on the slides that are on the PBIC website. The context classification of a roadway informs decisions made during various project development phases. That's a theme that we're going to talk about also in a roadway safety audit um, webinar, which is, I believe, our next one. Um, thinking about that life cycle from policy through planning, design, construction, maintenance, and operations, um, about how to support safe and comfortable travel for the users who are anticipated on a given facility. Um, and it's important that that user need is 
identified and understood early in the life cycle of a project. Um, and that the context classification then doesn't sort of end as this sort of idea of what should be there. It actually ties to the manual and says, okay, now that you've picked the modes that are important and the context of that particular corridor, let's look at the design manual and figure out what it tells us we should be building in that location. So another um, document that I was thinking of as I was looking back at these older ITE resources um, is this pamphlet I just happened to keep on my desk. I have it, I have it right here um, from CNU, and it's called Sustainable Street Network Principles. It's um, uh, a little document drafted by some of the best advocates of streets as places. Um, today, if you look at the, the author's list, you'll recognize a lot of the names, and it lists principles and characteristics of sustainable streets. These are some of my favorites. They're like the building blocks for a sustainable transportation system. You know, safe and walkable, different overlapping modal networks converging at interesting places where people want to be, many route choices to get to different destinations, and a very uh, mix of street types with different modal emphases and roles. Not every street has to be the same, um, and not every segment of every street has to be the same. It can change over time. So there's an Ostroads webinar um, Ostroads is an organization that exists in Australasia that sort of like our AASHTO, TRB, kind of a place where research happens and then feeds back into practice. Um, they did a great webinar with Transport for New South Wales, which was one of the, the states we visited um, when we went to Australia. The breaks down movement in place is kind of similar to this into their constituent parts. Um, here's a QR code for that. Definitely go check that out. Um, it looks at movement in sort of three different um, characteristics. There's through movement, right? That's what we generally think of going through a corridor. But then there's also to from movement. And this is really more about local trips. The example of, for example, um, if you travel from your house to your neighbor's house, um, you know, a few blocks away. And then there's within movement. And this is movement, you know, maybe going just across the street or interacting in a space directly outside a business on a sidewalk. And place is broken down into six elements, three fairly tangible elements and three that are a little bit more abstract. So activity, that refers to what you're doing on the street, the purpose that brings you there. Physical form describes how the space is composed, maybe the materials and the dimensions. Um, if there's a tree canopy or lack thereof, um, is there a buffer along the edge of the, the roadway between the pedestrian realm and the, the traveled way? And then floating above these are the, the abstract elements of like the environmental impacts or benefits, um, the social and cultural values that a place embodies, and the economic value that it affords through the commerce that happens in that location. Um, so the movement characteristics are distributed throughout the right of way and perhaps even into semi public or private domains, like if you have courtyards or colonnades that might border the right of way. Um, and place characteristics, they really straddle the zone between the right-of-way and the private realm. Um, in many cases, you know, a, a cycle track or a bike parking um, facility or the landscaping um, that's doing stormwater management, stormwater infiltration, is not just there for those practical purposes. It's also characterizing um, the place. It's creating the um, meaning and the social and cultural kind of experience of being in that place. Um, so we can't really divorce them or separate them or think about them in isolation. They all contribute. And actually, as tra transportation practitioners, we kind of play the role um, of urban designers in some cases. Um, so uh, that's something to, to be thinking about. Um, and again, if we look at the um, purpose of this project, the whole purpose where we started was generating uh, was generated by an inquiry into the pedestrian safety on arterials um, the epidemic that we have. The point here is you can't have pedestrian safety without intentional design for human beings. So um, if uh, if you look at this um, image here, we have a strode that's missing. Um, it, it has commerce, right? It has through movement, uh, but it's it's sort of missing the important parts of what make commerce and movement work together to create a place. This is kind of a vacuous environment. Um, so let's go back and, and look at this image that we showed on the first webinar, thinking about how this can work for us here in the US. Um, 
specifically linking movement in place. So we noted that policy is about determining what outcomes we want to achieve. Those outcomes should drive our adaptation of movement in place. We want economic growth. We want to solve the climate crisis. Uh, we want zero deaths and serious injuries on our roadways. These are policies that we establish that should push us to adopting movement in place or some version thereof um, so that we can have that context classification system in our transportation network uh, planning. Just the way Florida and other states and metropolitan areas in the, in the country are already doing. Once adopted, the movement in place framework can then slide into our long range uh, metropolitan and statewide planning process in the development of the LRTP and the MTP, the long range transportation metropolitan transportation plans, as well as area plans or, you know, a, a, a pet bike master plan for a small town that can still take into consideration this movement in place as a guiding principle for the planning that's happening there. Um, these are documents that typically have a long time horizon and are updated periodically. So it's the perfect vehicle to operationalize movement in place, which is about identifying where we are today and where we want to be in the future and then incrementally pursuing that change. The LRTP and the MTP should influence what projects then get programmed in the regional and statewide transportation improvement programs. And these projects are, again, these are the incremental steps by which we achieve the plans set out in the LRTP and the MTP, which are designed to realize the outcomes of our policies. Um, so those specific projects, when added to the tip and the step, should be designed. Um, oh, by the way, if you want to go into a little bit of a nerd out and look at your US um, code and code of federal reg regulations, that actually describes the intended relationship between the LRTP and um, and the MTP and the STIP and the TIP. Um, so that, that language is in our law and regulation. Um, we just need to sort of uh, operationalize it. And movement in place is, I think, a great tool to help us do that to achieve good results. Um, so then we want, as I've been saying, we want that programmed set of projects to look at what they've been characterized as, what their classification is, what modes they're supposed to serve on the network, and then use design standards um, to influence that and tell us what types of elements should be in the cross section uh, in a given location on the network. And then finally, we want to measure our performance and go back and look at our policies and see how we can keep the cycle going for continuous improvement. Um, so to sum up, we need our transportation planning process to classify existing and desired movement and place on a matrix like this. We want to know what we're trying to change where it is on the network, and how we want it to change. We need to prioritize different modes for access across our transportation system at a network scale. If we're just trying to do this a block at a time, a project at a time in isolation, it's really hard. It's much harder to make the argument for the trade-offs that need to happen in a given corridor if it's just being treated in isolation. It's critical for us to understand the role that each individual project plays in achieving this larger whole. Um, and of course, not every street can serve every mode equally. Sometimes multiple modes may be prioritized on the same corridor. Again, those high streets, so those main arterials that need to serve a lot of different traffic for a lot of different purposes, moving a lot of different people, not just vehicle traffic, um, but bus, ped, bike, traffic, et cetera, freight. And so one of the things that we need to do is we need to cross tabulate our modal priorities and our context that we can determine which format of mode is best suited to sharing space within the right of way. Um, and then we can design to accommodate those formats. So we need policies to regulate unwanted formats. Think about, for example, having vans and cargo bikes in really dense urban areas instead of the huge WB40 trucks uh, in, in that kind of environment. Or we have congestion pricing or high occupancy vehicle lanes to reduce the number of private vehicles on the roadway and allow there to be space for other types of, of formats. We also need funding, of course, for the formats we want instead. We can't just restrict. We need to make other options available. So frequent high, high quality public transit service, bike share, ADA accessible routes to get places. This costs money. Um, and it's part of serving the modes that are going to best serve our needs in the community. Um, which, speaking of which, you know, there's a common image that you see in a lot of uh, presentations looking at how many people can I move through a given set of modes and in urban areas, um, but also suburban and rural contexts, you know, policies and funding emphasis 
emphases should consider how to accommodate the movement of goods and people most efficiently. Just that language, goods and people, is a way to kind of change the conversation and not have it be a sort of foregone conclusion that we have to move X number of vehicles to get this many people through. We can move people in other ways. And we know that in the right context with the right um, amount of pedestrian or of, of trip generation um, and the right density of uses, we can actually dramatically increase the carrying capacity of our existing networks without increasing right of way, um, while also creating place benefits that support safer uh, and more equitable mobility and access at a human scale. So again, once we have the context classification and the modal priorities that points to the gaps in the network where our existing baseline doesn't match our target, you know, we have a, a place that is not being served by transportation, or we have a transportation corridor that could become more of a place and exude more economic benefit and just value for us in our lives. We develop projects to fill those gaps. And we turn to our design guidelines to get that direction on how to compose or manage each segment of the network. So for example, main streets, this is transport for New South Wales, movement in place framework, and their design guide specifically calls out for each one of those street types those context classifications, what's appropriate? What are the types of land uses we see here? What do the frontages look like? What are the posted speeds and the design speeds? How are we accommodating active transportation, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera? It's not sort of up for debate or a suggestion. It's more rigorously defined what's appropriate in that context. And it's not telling you, hey, thou shalt build this exact design here. It's saying, if you choose to identify this segment of the network as having this role, then here's what's appropriate for mixing these types of modes in that, in that environment. Um, another thing that we'll talk about in our final webinar is matching speed to context or having a speed management policy. It's really critical to be able to say the appropriate speed for this place on the matrix of movement and place is X. And because this is the kind of environment we want to have there, these are the kind of modes we're expecting to interact with each other, and therefore these are the speeds that will ensure that crashes, when they do happen, are survivable. Um, going back to our sort of guiding principles of, of Vision Zero and the safe system approach. Uh, so one of the things that I think was a really big aha moment for us um, in Australia and New Zealand is that each corridor may do many different jobs. And in the States, you know, we think of functional classification and we have an arterial, it's an arterial here, it's an arterial at the other end and everywhere in between. And therefore the design is defined by that role, that function or functional class. But in fact, the context along uh, an arterial corridor can change dramatically. And the types of land uses and how they can be served best to move goods and people um, really dramatically can change. And so therefore the transportation environment needs to change as well. Um, so this is a, a graphic from the Auckland design manual and you know, it accompanied, is accompanied by this text. Um, it's fundamental to street design to understand how corridors change along their length. So I'm gonna show you a quick example from our visit, again, leaning heavily on Australia since they're not represented, it's just too early for them. Um, but we'll have more examples from, um, from our friends from New Zealand here shortly. We went out to Parramatta, which is outside of Sydney. Um, it's another sort of central business district hub. And I'm going to take you just on a tour through a corridor that leads into um, Parramatta from sort of an outlying area um, with, with access to a lot of vehicles from larger roads in, in less populated areas. Um, so this is Pitt Street, which goes up and turns into uh, Macqu Macquarie Street, which is what we'll be looking at. And in this location, it's three lanes. We've got parking on one side, so it's actually four lanes wide. The speed limit is 60 kilometers per hour. Um, oops. We turn the corner, heading into um, the, the central business district. This corridor is still three lanes. There's still parking. It's still 60 kilometers per hour. And then there's this speed table in the middle of it with a, a crossing um, between two businesses. The, Speed table has a posted speed of 25 kilometers per hour. We've lost the parking, so we're now just down to three lanes. So this is a, a suggestion, a design element that says, hey, start to slow down. You're entering a different context. 
Now we have two lanes diverting off to the left here. Um, it's still a three lane cross section, but it's about to become a one lane cross section with parking. And if you're wondering what that little stop sign is, um, I think I can show you with my laser pointer if you're not seeing it. Um, bicyclists are actually allowed to use the sidewalk in this particular part of town. And they have these ped bike signals actually at some of the intersections saying whether you can cross on your bike and on foot. Um, so when you cross um, that intersection and you get to the next block, um, there are these edge islands on both sides of the street that really dramatically narrow the street down. And um, when I zoom in on that location, you can see they've really fattened up the parking to take that four lane cross section and make it a three lane cross section, narrowing the roadway um, as much as possible. The speed limit on this corridor used to be um, 50 kilometers per hour with two lanes of, of travel, two lanes of traffic. Now it's 40. Um, they've got signage up saying, hey, this is a 40 mile or kilometer per hour zone. High pedestrian activity is expected. Then um, the corridor actually opens up again and you see the um, continued diversion of vehicle trips. So even though you can be on that block in a car, you're sort of encouraged and, and afforded the opportunity to get off of it and go to other parts of um, the, the sort of out, outlying area of the central business district. And again, this becomes an area where all of a sudden you could see speeds increasing again. And so they've introduced speed uh, and red light cameras in this zone and they're posted um, to let people know what to expect in those locations to manage speed because the design of that environment can't really necessarily manage speed the way it could at the beginning of the block where it was constricted. Um, and so they need to have this other element of speed management. Um, there's repeated edge islands again at the next um, the next block. Um, and then the arrival at this Church Street light rail corridor. And we recognize that not every arterial in the country um, is eventually going to cross a beautiful light rail corridor and need to be road dyed like this. But the principle is that this road changes dramatically block by block over a very short amount of time to go from a 60 kilometer per hour three lane road to a one lane road. Um, with uh, a 40 kilometer per hour speed limit. Um, and then the environment changes more dramatically, where you have just a, a, a little roadway along the side of this light rail corridor, you know, a, a very gracious pedestrian realm with a lot of landscaping, um, good pedestrian protection to get people in and out of the, the boarding islands. And so that context, again, is defining what the design of that streetway or that street looks like. And then you see the commensurate increase in, in denser building happening um, along the edges uh, of this corridor. Um, there was some question about public engagement in our last webinar, so I want to just briefly pay um, a little bit of um, attention to that. There was a document that we saw, um, short brochures that were made up for major projects that are happening to help explain. This is, for example, a state route um, through a rural town. So these are friendly graphics that kind of explain what's happening and why. Um, to make sure people are informed about the logic uh, of change happening, even in a, in a smaller residential town or a rural town. Um, we saw posters and flyers kind of explaining what's happening and why. This is um, the SNP on Queen Street in Auckland, which is a section of the block that was going to be prohibited for vehicle use, but allow transit use to really discourage people from driving um, on this particular corridor um, and explaining why that was happening. Um, we saw a lot of clear, friendly public signage and messaging at new project locations so people know what's coming and you know why there's construction happening, um, what routes are going to be improved. Um, and we saw sort of friendly uh, explanative installations to activate public spaces. So this is a interesting sort of trolley parklet um, that we saw outside of um, Parramatta in the, the streets I was just showing you. Um, so some interesting ways to kind of Make sure people are informed, build that social license, show people what an environment that's more place focused could be like um, on a given corridor uh, and try to keep that conversation kind of positive and friendly and engaging as opposed to doing it, you know, in the hidden shadows and then rolling it out all of a sudden. Um, I am going to stop here and hand it over to Andrew, who is going to talk about Auckland's uh, transportation planning lifecycle and go into a little bit more depth about uh, many of these elements.
So thank you, and uh, Andrew, take it away. Thank you. Hopefully, everyone can see my screen. Yes, it looks good. Excellent. Okay, cool. I'll get going. Uh, thanks, everyone. Um, so I'm just going to talk about Auckland. So Auckland specifically is a uh, uh, region within New Zealand. It's got a third of the country's population in it um, for context. If I can get my slides to work. Oh, so, so our strategic transport planning framework, um, what we have is we exist um, Auckland Transport as an entity which was created about 12 years ago to oversee all transport within um, Auckland. And so we report to both the Auckland Council, which sets the planning framework for the region across all aspects, and then also the government, which sets their own government policy statement on land transport. And what happens is the council and government get together and agree on transport priorities through what's called the Auckland Transport Alignment Project. And um, then it is funded at council end by the long-term plan and by the government end by the National Land Transport Program. And then what we've got to help inform that Auckland Transport Alignment Project is um, our network plan, Future Connect. And then the outcome of the Auckland Transport Alignment Project is our regional land transport plan, which is in the investment plan. So it sets out what's gonna be funded, what's gonna change over the next decade. And we use a series of tools um, associated with Future Connect for each project as it goes through the system. What I'm gonna be taking you through in a bit more detail are some of those tools so that you can understand the, the process we go through for each project um, as it gets proposed and then it gets funded and taken through. The process so this is them in a simpler form starting with future connect um, future connect is our network plan so what it does is it contains three things it contains our strategic networks and supporting networks for each of the five modes of transport it then analyzes those networks across the region to identify where there are deficiencies or opportunities and then it creates a high level sense of okay so where are the big issues we need to sort out um, over the coming decade. It looks 10 years ahead and it compares it to the current situation. What we did as part of creating this was to identify our strategic networks. So we had to go through a process of saying, okay, well, what roads are important for each mode of transport? Um, we had an existing one for public transport and general traffic. We developed with the freight industry, the freight one, and we developed with the cycling advocates, the cycling one, and we used GIS process to develop the walking network. And then we put them all together and digitized them all for the first time so that we could identify what roads are important for what modes of transport now and into the future. And particularly understand, therefore, what corridors have got multimodal um, importance to them um, for that specific set of modes so that it can help inform decisions. The second piece of work we do is this system analysis. So what we've done for each mode of transport is we've identified both deficiencies and opportunities so that you can get a sense of where are these modes not working and where they could work better. And it's either um, data proxies which look at the current situation and also ones which are looking at the future situation so that we can identify all the deficiencies and opportunities now in 2023 and then also the future ones in 10 years time. In addition to looking at them for the um, five modes, we've also um, assess them for environmental factors and safety factors as well, so that those are also brought in as deficiencies and or opportunities too. In the new version of Future Connect, which was just released, we've also included an equity lens as well. So we've, through um, spatial mapping of deprivation overlapping with uh, poor access, we've looked at where people can't meet their own local needs, where they can't meet their regional needs, and then also where the, tr the negative implications of the transport system are unfairly impacting people. So um, that's a new element which has just been brought into the new Future Connect, which was released uh, last week. 
The final aspect and the sort of so what is the focus areas. So what we do is we um, aggregate together deficiencies for each mode, categorized by a hierarchy of that mode. And then where you have multiple deficiencies on high hierarchy modes on a single corridor, that all aggregates into serious um, deficiencies and opportunities. And then we um, look at that and try to identify the real causes and sources of that in order to produce the final version of the focus areas, which is really looking at core problems in the region at a very high level. It's not the only problems, but if you had to pick the top 20, say, um, these are the top 20 problems in the area, in the overall region. So that's what we've identified here. And then the process from this is to then say, okay, well, now what we're going to do is we're going to form teams to in do business cases to dive deep into this and identify the real problems and the real opportunities with a solution lens associated with it. So the second component then is the roads and streets framework, which is our movement in place framework. And I'll show you what that does and I'll show you also the link back to the uh, Future Connect network plan. This is where we set the movement level, place level, and modal priorities for Auckland. And it follows the step-by-step -step process on the right. And I'll take you through that. The first thing to do is to identify a whole lot of information associated. So in terms of movement, um, getting that info is looking at Future Connect. Future Connect is where all of the movement information is located. In terms of place, we're looking at things like land use planning tools that we've got from Auckland Council and bringing all of that together. Then what we do is step two, which is identifying the movement and the place aspects. So place is about to what extent is this road or street that's adjacent land use a destination? So how many people and by how much um, around the region are traveling here? Um, and so we've broken it into three groups. So is it places that only a small number of local people go like you know your street through to, is it a place that large numbers of people or goods travel to from all over the region. So places like a port or a stadium, for instance. And then we go into movement. And so to what extent is this road and street important for the movement of people and goods as part of the network? And this is where we're using Future Connect. So we're looking at these strategic networks and the hierarchy within them. And the important thing to note as well with movement is we look at each mode individually and we take the highest from that. So um, a busway is really important for buses, but it's not important for freight or for cycling or for general traffic, but because it's high movement for public transport, it's therefore high movement. Um, it only has to be high movement for one mode in order to be high movement. And again, we're looking at it on three levels, local, um, travel only, nothing really strategic like a quiet suburban street through to core corridors where important regional movement is occurring. So that could be a busway or a train line. That could be a pedestrian mall in the city centre. That could be a motorway. And then what we're doing is we're bringing it together and making a decision around, is it place level one, two, three, and is it movement level one, two, or three to identify which segment it should be in. We're doing that for how it is now, and we're also looking ahead 10 years to say how it will be in the future. And things can change in the future in terms of place and or movement. Bus routes get moved, new land uses get constructed, and so things like that can change. It's important to know where that change is going to be occurring. The other key component is the modal priority assessment. So what we do is we look at the modal priorities now as they are and say, this is how they are right now, which is our first graph. And then we say, if we could have them the way we'd want them to be right now, how would we have them? And that's our optimal situation. And then again, we look ahead 10 years and that's taking into account changes in movement and or place which will occur in those 10 years and we're making further changes. Sometimes there are no changes. So if the movement in place isn't changing in the future, um, the motor priorities likely won't change from the current optimal, but sometimes they do. And so what we're doing is adjusting those modal priorities. 
um, so that you can get a sense of what change is occurring over that 10 year period. What we do is we have a seven level scale for each mode, um, as well as parking and loading and servicing. We've added those in there as well. And what you can see in the top right, for instance, is a, a sort of indication of the level of standards that we're representing with this seven point scale. And then as an example for walking, um, these are the types of things that we're considering when we're looking at each mode and to determine its um, modal priority situation and its preferred status. And we have one of these for each of the modes as well as um, parking and loading and servicing. It's not about allocating specific space to a corridor. It's about time and space allocation. It's about do you have what you need in order to meet your needs as a mode? Because obviously different modes have different needs in time and space allocation. And the final component then is filling it all out in a mandate. Um, we have a consistent working group and steering group across all roads and streets um, assessments so that we're trying to reduce the risk of inconsistency being applied to the tool and system. And then we're applying this as part of all of our capital projects. Another cool thing that we've done is we've automated the process um, for all roads and streets in the Auckland region. So we've got um, the current and future modal typologies and also the modal priorities. Um, we can't do a calculation um, of observed because the computer's not smart enough. Um, but what we're doing progressively is as we're completing our own assessments, we're overriding the automated assessment with those um, specifically uh, human created assessments. And so that all is provided for everyone as well. The network operating plan is the third component of um, our system. And so what it's really about is turning that strategy in real into reality. So it's taking Future Connect and the Roads and Streets framework and then making short-term changes to the network where there's a need to modify things while we wait for a big long-term evolutionary change to the transport system. Um, so what the network operating plan does is these five things. So in terms of operations performance monitoring, it enables us with our level of service standards to analyze the network for each mode and identify how it's performing right now so that we can identify deficiencies and issues that need to be addressed now. And this connects back to the current system analysis in Future Connect. So it's based on that. The second thing it does is network operations. So we have the Auckland Transport Operations Centre, which is overseeing the whole region's transport operations and is setting um, guidance on how to move things. And so they are guided by the network operating plan on what the priorities should be um, at different signalised intersections, for instance, and different movement corridors so that they can prioritise different modes at different times. The third thing is the network optimization. And so this is uh, a core part of this process whereby it's looking at how we moving people and goods at specific times in specific locations. And they've set up a set of principles associated with that, which are on the left. And then what they do is they monitor um, the operation of those modes across that region to identify where they are falling short of the level of service standards. And then there is a program, a capital and OPEX program associated with that to make modifications. So where on a street, um, pedestrians and cyclists are not getting appropriate level of service standards, they will then intervene. So they will adjust um, signals, they will put in shading, they will put in curb build outs, they will do what is needed in order to get that level of service standard up for that particular mode where it is strategic. And they have that ability to do these short term, low cost, low risk solutions, which mean that the level of service can go up to an appropriate level or a baseline level. Um, and it's almost like a sticky tape solution while we wait for those bigger, higher cost, major projects to come along, which may take a decade or more to come along. 
and what they've developed is details around each of the level of service standards for each mode so that they can understand what they're monitoring and then also what they're aiming towards to identify those deficiencies here and now. Uh, temporary traffic management is another component that the network operating plan uses. So we, where we have events, where we have changes to roads or streets based on the need for construction, we can say, okay, well, this street, yes, you can have your um, project happen here. However, this street is strategically important for cycling. So you do need to ensure that you are maintaining a link for cycling throughout this project. Um, so it's using those strategic modes again in order to provide guidance on what's critical for continuation of movement or place during that process. And the final component is the network operating plan assessment tool, where when projects are coming along, they're able to look at them and say, what impact is this going to have on helping us align with where we're trying to get to in terms of the level of service standards for particular modes. So projects are taken through this tool and tested to see whether they will align. They're not meant to necessarily achieve the desired level of service standard, but it's about being in the right direction. So not going backwards and at least contributing something towards the goal we're trying to set for ourselves. And the final component is the transport design manual, uh, which is where it all comes together. This is our design guidance, which is provided for everyone who is designing a road or street in the Auckland region. And it's a principle-based system which takes people through how roads and streets should be designed, who they should be designed for, and links back to the Future Connect strategic networks and also links back to the roads and streets framework. So it uses the different typologies in the roads and streets framework to give like a shopping list of here's elements to consider in developing your road or street design based on the movement place and modal priority assessment, which has occurred in your earlier assessment. And so projects are moving through this whole ecosystem of first off saying, well, these are the roads and streets that are important. These are where they're deficient. This is what's important now and for the future and how it's not working. Here's how the system should work now. And here's how it should be designed so that it can best achieve the strategic goals that we've set for the region. And through the processes we've built across the business, it's meaning that we are now having um, roads and streets being designed and built and constructed in a more strategic way so that our design strategy is aligning with our outcomes and outputs. So that's it from me. Um, thank you very much. And I'd really encourage everybody to check out all of our tools and plans on our website. Um, it's all very interactive and mapping based. So uh, anyone can use it and we're very, very proud of it. Thank you. Kia ora everyone. Uh, my name is Wayne Sharplin. I'm just going to start screen sharing now and I'll take you through the One Network Framework. Uh, so the One Network Framework is our national um, movement and place-based framework here in New Zealand. Um, sorry, just get my slides right. So I'll start off with how we've been doing it to date. So in 2012, a government task force recommended a consistent roading classification to improve road maintenance investment decisions in New Zealand. And this was a giant leap forward in terms of the benchmarking investment and asset management um, and providing a nationally consistent framework for New Zealand. The benchmarking subsequently became embedded in a number of our transport national policies and systems across the sector. And the Wonderwork Road Classification success was largely, largely attributed to the combined partnership of local government and Waka Kotahi, promoting a for the sector, by the sector philosophy. So this is the same sort of philosophy we've used as we've gone throughout uh, the development of the One Network framework. So in 2019, the same partnership group started looking at emphasizing the value of how place might fit into the framework and undertook a collaborative exercise between central and local government organizations to work through detailed design of the One Network Framework and produce guidance as well as a reclassification of the network at a national scale with the new One Network Framework. Very similar names, different uh, elements. 
I'll touch on the reclassification of the network shortly, but essentially it was an automated desktop exercise um, and then we offered ongoing support for road controlling authorities with moderation refinement of their network classifications. We're now continuing this ongoing implementation, uh, so you'll see June 2021 onwards is really where we're at now. Um, and a major part of the change that's needed is really a mind shift change needed from planning through to investment um, and changes around policy, guidance and process to really embed the framework. It's very similar to what Andrew was just talking about with the roads and stream streets framework for Auckland, which is also a movement and base place framework. But this is trying to scale it nationally uh, for all road controlling authorities to use throughout the country. So I'm going to break down the rest of my presentation a little bit into these four groups that uh, Jonah was talking about before. Um, firstly, as I mentioned, the One Network Framework considers the role that roads and streets play as places, uh, with some roads and streets being destinations in their own right, as well as movement corridors. It considers the current and future network classifications, and part of the One Network Framework includes modal classifications that allow for the multimodal network planning and includes off-road routes that contribute to transport by some modes. And I know that was a topic of um, a few questions last week around the off-road routes, so I'll touch on that shortly. It shifts the emphasis to the movement of people and goods rather than vehicles uh, overall. So whilst the One Network Road classification, which was the first one I talked about, was a fantastic benchmarking tool, uh, especially for measuring freight and traffic, it struggled a lot in the urban environment and the complexity of urban environments in the surrounding land use context. So by acknowledging the place element in the new One Network framework, we can start to manage the urban environments a bit better. As a reminder, this is what uh, Jonah showed before about what our One Network framework movement and, base, uh, movement and place based framework looks like. So how do we define place? Well, it's the extent to which the land use along the side of a road or street is a destination that people want to visit or spend time in. And it relates to the on-street activity generated by adjacent land use and it, the need for access from the transport corridor to that land use. It's also informed by that adjacent um, land and the density of activity occurring off-street or on-street uh, in some cases where people may want to hang out and socialize. So it considers the role that transport corridors play in providing those social spaces for people to interact and enjoy, but also that interplay within uh, the transport corridor and the surrounding land use, that, that place-based function. Um, based on the fact that uh, this is all location-based information that we're talking about, it really points to that spatial-based system being the best repository of information. So in New Zealand, we've got a system called Megamaps, which houses a number of data sets in a spatial view. Uh, this was originally used as the base data set for applying the ONF movement in place framework. The system contains geospatial representation of every public road corridor in New Zealand, which is approximately 100,000 kilometres. Not sure what that is in miles, but the data is segmented into approximately 60,000 corridors at locations where a change in speed limit or a major change in the land use occurs. In addition, um, a range of base attributes are recorded for each corridor, such as the speed limit, traffic volumes, and the surrounding land use. This example I've got here shows you the land use of the urban fringe in Hamilton, um, which is just south of Auckland in New Zealand. So having this information, our consultant came up with a formula to convert the data and Megamaps tool to the ONF street classifications, which was anticipated that it would return about an 80% accuracy rate for the country, uh, with moderation and manual changes needed by road controlling authorities over the last couple of years. So the classification occurs based on the metrics, then moderation to look at consistency within the network and between networks, um, and then that was kind of fed back th through to us to help with the classification guidance materials that were produced as well. So whilst the desktop and automation exercise uh, was un undertaken initially, it's that conversation um, and the moderation at the local level that really plays a key part in keeping this information up to date, and that will be needed as well going forward. Uh, so how do we look at movement? Well, it's pr primarily assessed using the old ONRC-based um, information which was around the AADT, Annual Average Daily Traffic Volumes, um, and with our state highways having a movement score of at least three to recognise the inherent movement functions of our highways. This shows how it was being done under the ONRC on the left there, uh, where a corridor has the same classification whole way along, in this case a regional um, 
corridor. But the right shows us what the same corridor might lo look like using the ONF where it changes the classification of the street based on the surrounding land context around the way and the way that part of the corridor functions. So rather than just one long um, corridor with the same classification, we've broken it up into uh, five or six smaller segments that actually link in with that surrounding land use. So as I mentioned, all roads and streets in the country have been classified already based on those current functions. And these are stored in a system that we call RAM, which is a asset management tool um, used across all RCAs around the country. And the road controlling authorities are still in the process of classifying their modal networks, but essentially um, this brings it all in to one place so that uh, ONF can be used or discussed to show a high level network view as you've got on the, the left there. Um, you can start to get into the individual corridors um, through townships, et cetera, where it might change multiple times. And then when you cl click on an individual street segment, you can actually look at all the components that maybe make up that particular street segment from the uh, movement in place classifications, what the overall street category is, and drilling down into those individual modal classifications as well. So you can imagine this has been a bit of an uh, effort to do on a national scale. From that point, um, and similar to what Andrew was talking about before around levels of service, we can start to look at performance and um, metrics for the networks, as well as understanding what uh, levers we might be able to pull to help um, with a particular mode on a particular corridor. Uh, it's it's really based on what's important as a user for these particular modes and what those expectations of the users might be in some instances as well. Um, this leads way to that that set of measures and metrics that we can look at um, at a national level and try and get some consistency, which allows us to then make decisions around uh, how we fund particular activities in New Zealand as well. Note that this is still a work in progress, um, so it's draft format at the moment, and it's likely that it will look a little bit different once it's um, actually fully implemented. So we're looking at doing this within the next six months or so uh, to bring up, bring in the levels of service sort of conversation as well. Similar to what Andrew was saying as well about planning for the future networks, um, we have the future network planning process in New Zealand, and this is a high level process that broadly utilised many aspects of network operating framework um, planning process um, that was historically used, uh, but lifted up slightly higher. And this process requires multi a multidisciplinary team um, of land use planners, transport planners, spatial planners, asset managers, and others all inputting into this work. Um, and what's interesting is really bringing in that uh, maintenance and operations, because you want to have those conversations around uh, how a network will continue to be maintained after any new designs and everything have been done. Um, so bringing them into the conversation early on helps to take them, uh, people who look after the maintenance and operations on that journey as well. So part of the future network planning process is the need to gather all the inputs required to make sure that those quality decisions can be made. Um, and that means that you need to look at things like the current legislation. Uh, in New Zealand, we've got a government policy statement which sets out the expectations for the transport network uh, by the ministry and other government policies and things as well. Uh, you take your strategic inputs and also your local input um, feedback and everything for your local network in your area to then start to discuss, well, how do we want this to shape in the future? A key output of the future network planning process is that 10-year network map that includes the future land use aspirations as well. Um, and then you portray this in GIS mapping. So in our, uh, in our example, we use the RAM system, as I mentioned before. The future network uh, is then classified using the ONF for all transport modes, and uh, it should really provide clear differences between the current and future state of the network as well. Uh, that then is used to target the desired outcomes by assisting in the identification of those priority investigations, business cases, or anywhere that you may need to do more detailed network planning and subsequent investment through our national land transport funds. This is what it looks like on a map. Um, so you've got the current network at the top, just as an example, it's, this is an actual real example, but um, these will then form the decision and changes that need to take place over time. So at the bottom there, you've got the future network as well. I've highlighted a couple of places where that changes, but you can then isolate those areas where you might have um, 
change needed and start to work out what the designs of those might look like or what the funding might be. Um, similarly, you may want to look at things such as speed calming or improved facilities and other design features that help to bring about that uh, aspirational 10-year future network view as well. So at a high level with the ONF, you've got the street family, whether it's an urban or rural context, because obviously for a lot of New Zealand, we've got rural um, areas as well. Uh, but today we're really focusing on that urban side. And then when you work out your movement in place rankings and the overall criteria for uh, what is in those street categories, you'll, you'll start to come up with the street category functions and the street classification. Then you can move on to the more detailed information, as I mentioned, which is how each part of the network contributes to a strategic significance for particular modal networks. As an example, for the walking network in New Zealand, this is our, our key four levels of classification. Um, predominantly based on the way people use the network and that connectivity it provides uh, with the network. We don't really have great volumetric data around uh, walking and therefore local judgment and knowledge of the network is needed in many places to determine how that particular uh, part of the road or street is classified. So for example, the overall look and feel of a route and the type of place it serves would be considered when you're determining um, which classification it has. So uh, there's four levels for walking, um, primary, secondary, supporting, and special. I'll show you now what these modal networks look like a bit on a map. So this is a map of Christchurch in the South Island. To give you an idea of what that looks like, uh, this one here is freight. The darker the color represents a higher classification and all the um, roads and streets where freight is allowed to access, um, whether that's light freight or heavy freight is, is identified on the map. And as I mentioned, the darker um, colors are the, the higher used priority freight networks. Again, looking at the map from the public transport context, um, darker color, again, representing the higher classification. Um, and you obviously don't need PT facilities on every road and street, but on the PT corridors, and especially those that are darker, you may want to look at how a particular PT facility, public transport facility or bus lane or whatever it may be is designed um, with the darker corridors, maybe wanting to put in those bus lanes and be the priority for where you do better design of the public transport facilities. So this one's the walking map. Um, note how walking includes the off-road routes. Uh, and I know there's a bit of, uh, like I said, questions around this last week about how you, you might include off-road routes as part of your network. So walking um, off-road routes also play a key part in the transport corridor, whether they go through a park or um, along a roadside. So while traditionally these aren't funded from the National Land Transport Fund uh, and more likely something like a parks and recreation funding um, stream, it allows that conversation to occur by highlighting which parts of the path are actually critical to our transport network still, regardless of how it's actually been previously funded or, or will be funded going forward. Similar to what Andrew was talking about before with the operational performance of the network, once you get into uh, classifying it, we can start to look at the service standards on a national scale. Again, this is a draft example of what the level of service conversations uh, that we can start to have. Um, and But when you understand the various modal networks you, and uh, agreed for that particular road or street, then you can start to deliberately have those conversations about uh, trade-off between particular modes, adjusting things like signal phasing or who gets priority on a particular location or corridor. Um, this is just a bit of an example from the, the network operating framework previously um, around. And once again, we'll develop this a bit further over the next six months or so um, to enable those conversations to occur around the country. So one way that the um, one network framework is being used nationally, uh, well, in New Zealand, we have a vision of zero deaths and serious injuries on New Zealand roads by 2050. Um, this is strategy is called the road to zero. Road to Zero uh, really puts the human well-being at the heart of our road and transport planning. And remember that this is a vision um, for us. So uh, a lot of people have said, you're never going to meet that target. Well, if we don't, we don't, but it's the target. It's what we're aiming for, and it's what we're trying to achieve. So one of the key focus areas of the Road to Zero is infrastructure improvements and speed management. Um, and this is enabled through the recently uh, published Speed Management Guide for New Zealand. The One Network Framework Movement in Place based framework is one of the four key principles of the Speed Management Guide that was released um, earlier last year, I believe. And this guide gives effect to a, a, the speed management rule and the law around it. 
this is what it kind of looks like when you start to talk about it in the context of movement in place. So street categories with higher place and less movement would have lower speed limits in general. Then as the movement increases and the elements of place decrease and therefore probably less people walking, uh, cycling in those locations, you can start to look at having maybe those higher speed limits. Again, apologies that we're obviously in kilometers now here in New Zealand, but you can start to see that, you know, trans corridors, which are your motorways um, and the likes may have that higher 80 kilometer plus speed limit versus a civic space, which might be lower speed limits around 10 to 20 kilometers an hour. So that's pretty much everything I've got, though I did note that also on last week's webinar, there was a bit of discussion around the pink path in Auckland, so I thought I'd just throw these photos in. Um, Te Ara Ifiti is the light path uh, shared cycleway in Auckland, which was converted from the old Nelson Street off-ramp um, and is now a key connection in the Auckland cycling network. And that's it for me. Wonderful. Thank you, Wayne. Thank you, Jonah and Andrew. Uh, we'll bring it back here for a little bit of discussion. We got some good questions uh, that came in and we've got a little time to, to respond to those. Um, let's start here. Jonah, um, you raised early on the uh, transportation planning uh, and urban design connection. Um, and I think uh, this person can safely say that the post-World War II American cities um, have largely been shaped by the auto industry, uh, except for a brief period around the 70s um, the designers, urban or otherwise, have been on the outside looking in. And this person's experience, it seems that designers tend to defer to traffic engineers. And so if bringing urban designers into the conversation would be useful, what's the best way to do this or at least start that conversation? Yeah, there's, um, <clears throat> I think it's, that feels so obvious to me that urban designers would be part of designing a transportation system that it's good to get reminded that it's not for everybody. I think um, this diagram from Waka Katai talks about kind of overlapping roles aligned with movement and place that planning and design play. Um, and that <clears throat> traffic engineers and urban designers need to kind of coordinate and play a role together in devising the, ty the type of environment that is going to be part of delivering the place that you want on a corridor. I don't know why. Um, I mean, I think it's just our auto-oriented nature that we're sort of saying, well, the traffic engineers show up and they've got a bunch of numbers and we've got a bunch of drawings on our side. So the numbers win, you know? I mean, that's a common kind of syndrome. Being able to have parity and make a more quantitative um, uh, argument for why place is important and why the elements of urban design are serving transportation and community-wide goals that need to be delivered as part of transportation projects is, I think, a strategy to get urban designers at the table earlier and, and throughout the process. Um, we're going to be talking about road safety audits later, and that's um, an idea that instead of just looking post-mortem after a crash has happened, we have sort of safety as an integrated element throughout the whole transportation life cycle. And I think um, that part of that, part of what we learned about with regard to the road safety audit process was the interactive or interdisciplinary nature of teams that deliver particularly larger projects in Australia and New Zealand, and that they'll have urban designers and they'll have folks coming up with these ideas about place um, in response to classification that identifies place as an important component of what the future state should be so that they can be delivering that along the way and not just sort of brought in to do renderings and throw in some landscaping at the last minute. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, I, I've got a related question that I wanted to issue to Wayne and Andrew, at least to start. Um, and that is, um, what is the relationship and coordination between planners and engineers in New Zealand and Australia? That it seems to this person that the policies are planning driven, but how do the plans translate into designs and uh, sort of more engineering standards and things like that uh, across the multiple roadway jurisdictions that maybe be along the same route, uh, you know, a lot of different interests and players there. Can you, could you elaborate a little bit on, I guess, that working relationship between planners and engineers um, where you're, where you're working? Um, I can go first. Um, I think in our area, it's, it's a good relationship um, on the basis that, the organization has set up a structure where planning comes first and engineering is sort of a following step. And so 
um, projects are being developed on the basis of well the planning has occurred and that's supported and encouraged so that's been really useful um, and it's it's got to be iterative as well so luckily what's um, good is the design team which runs the transport design manual is very um, focused on ensuring the outcomes match the strategy um, but essentially what we have is a process whereby the engineers are encouraged to come back to us and actually have to come back to us uh, through a design review panel as they're going through a detailed design process. Um, and I get to monitor and review projects to make sure that they're aligning with our strategy and our planning. Um, and where the engineers are encountering problems, they need to communicate with us and tell us, look, you've set these modal priorities. I can't meet this. And so we can look at it and identify what we can do. Um, but that's the way it's working here at AT and it's working really well, but I have been in situations where it's not um, as great and the engineers get to do what they like. Um, but I'm just really lucky that we're in a situation now where that's not the case. Yeah, and I think um, similarly, this is something we're seeing at the, the national scale, um, both within our organisation, because we are a road controlling authority and we set the guidance um, uh, and materials for a national scale, is that as that mind shift is starting to occur, the, the engineers are coming to talk to the planners a bit more, starting to have those discussions, and it is a bit of an iterative um, and interactive and collaborative process now. Um, a bit more than maybe what it was in the past where something would be handed off to someone say you deliver this or you figure this out and then it goes down the chain and you end up with something completely different to maybe what was initially envisioned in the strategy so I think that's been a, a big shift um, not to say they haven't always worked well together but we're seeing that more now that everyone is actually starting to use the same language um, and starting to use the same sort of principles around how they're doing it and we've got the things like the various street design guides uh, and everything to help um, give that information and, and one thing um, I've personally gone through and done a lot of training with our safety engineers for example around the country and actually helped to help them to understand the relationship between um, speed limits for example in the one network framework um, and then they start to think about the other safety design features as well so they're, they're all in that engineer um, area and I think we're going to see that progress further and further as this is uh, more embedded as well. Thank you for that. Joan anything to add there? there? Let's, um, let's get to one other question. This is maybe more of a clarifying question uh, for you, Andrew. Uh, part of your presentation, you were sharing a few of your, I think you called them the magic wand scenarios. Um, and in one of them, uh, this person asks if, uh, I guess, when the when you had bus trips and biking and walking trips trending upward or, or, or going up, uh, there, there wasn't a corresponding um, decrease in auto trips or uh, indicating substitution or replacement. I wonder if you could elaborate on that a bit. Yeah, sure. It's not about changing trips. It's about changing modal priority in terms of time and space allocation given for those modes on a road. So you can increase one without decreasing the other. So uh, we've got to remember that it's not just about space. So for pedestrians, you can increase their modal priority by providing them safer crossings. So raised zebra crossings, you can provide them um, increased level of service by shade and shelter, by widened footpaths, by removing clutter, mm -hmm. um, by reducing delays at intersections and things like that. So um, those types of things don't necessarily mean that it's punishing another mode. Um, and so that example is just, and, and it's a different modal priority graph for every single street. Um, that's not a standard modal priority graph. So that's just to indicate that you can change things um, for one without impacting on the other because they are not mutually exclusive. Often we will have to do that, um, but it's not always the case. And so I think that's important to note. Jonah, do you do you get the sense that uh, sometimes in the US these, these decisions are often posed as a one-to-one -one, uh, trade-off of sorts? So if you give to one group you're taking from another. It seems like this framing of uh, co-benefits or at least uh, no harm, uh, it would be very valuable if we could kind of move in that direction. Yeah, I think um, if you have a, a roadway functional class designation that has a certain criteria um, that means there's sort of like, in as, as people enter the room, there's already a threshold beyond which you can't go in terms of like addressing a, a degradation in level of service or something like that. 
then that's really problematic. And if you don't have good quantitative arguments for saying, well, here's how we're going to distribute goods and people throughout the network efficiently by a variety of modes. So this corridor can take the hit on vehicle travel or travel time um, or delay at an intersection because it's being offset elsewhere. We're going to shift modes in answer to that person's question. That does happen or that should be part of the planning, particularly over a 10 year time horizon to be able to do that. Um, does that answer your question? I think so. Yeah, that's uh, bringing it home a little bit. So I, I appreciate that. Um, there's another question here that um, it deals with the timeline for projects to be delivered. Um, this person says that the projects developed today uh, will be in construction for another or in construction in another five or seven years. That significantly reduces, reduces the ability to impact crashes for vulnerable road users in the interim or the near term. And so um, we need to have the ability to supplement projects with other countermeasures to reverse or at least address the safety trend in the short term. And I guess I wonder about this, this um, need to be looking ahead at, at long-term solutions while also treating the immediate need um, within uh, Wayne and Andrew, your your work. And, and how is this discussion um, handled uh, where you are? Is, is it um, something to be done in the interim while also looking looking long-term at what could, what could be built out permanently? Yeah, the way it's been done here is um, there's been a dedicated uh, road safety program um, and they are empowered and funded to make short-term um, changes. So they are going around the network doing things like installation of um, raised tables and raised intersections. Um, we're also uh, looking at speeds across the region. So for instance, in the city center, all speeds were dropped to 30 Ks an hour um, a couple of years ago. And they're looking, especially at rural speeds of reducing them um, an awful lot. So uh, there's things happening in the safety space all the time and it's not taking seven years. It, they're empowered to do things quickly and they're just doing it in a way which is in alignment with the strategic goals um, for the modes and the overall strategy of the network. Yeah, and I, th I think um, one thing that was discussed last week again um, was around the, uh, basically these strategies, these these frameworks and everything, setting up the mandate for people to have those tough conversations, to have those um you know, this is our long-term vision zero or road to zero strategy. Uh, therefore, anything we do that's aligned to that is uh, going to get a little bit more, um, We want, I don't like using the term social license, but essentially uh, it's communicated publicly. It gives ministers, it gives local councillors, it gives everyone that, that mandate to then be able to stand up and say, this is aligned to that work. Um, it, it doesn't negate the need for some community consultation, especially in those higher risk uh, or higher impact uh, areas, but it allows them to actually start to to be a bit more bold with the decisions being made on the ground. And, and like Andrew said, empowering um, people going out to actually do that work. Uh, they're the frontline staff. They're the ones doing this planning um, and knowing that they've got the backing of the organization and the country um, collectively as a whole at that, that higher level enables them to be able to go out and do take those measures and, and implement those various steps. I'll just add the, um, in New South Wales, you know, they categorically dropped the speed limit on a number of 60 kilometer per hour streets to 50, just overnight. Well, not overnight, but they rolled it out um, without a lot of other changes. They just changed the speed limit. And then they observed and saw where the speeds dropped and where they didn't. Then they said, okay, these are locations where we need to go in and do um, countermeasures to reduce speed. And vertical deflection is a very popular and I think um, effective, cost effective particularly, but effective strategy to get people to slow down. Um, I think I already said this in the previous webinar, but we want people to have their foot on the brake rather than on the gas as they're approaching a conflict zone. So where you have crosswalks, where you have intersections, certainly putting in roundabouts, which they've done a lot across Australasia, but also putting in these raised um, facilities that you have to drive up and over can be very effective um, in the short term at, at moderating speed. And then of course, they're using um, camera-based enforcement as well. And the examples I shared and that we saw in New South Wales are signed. But in Victoria, the state just south of New South Wales, they don't sign them. Cameras are hidden. You know, they have the legislation to be able to do that. 
and they said you're driving across the, the state and you cross the border from New South Wales into um, Victoria, you just see all the speed limits or the speeds plummet to the speed limit. The data are just like whoosh, off a cliff. Um, so there are there are ways if you can have the political will to manage speed in a very short amount of time. I to ask one final question here about um, about community engagement and public engagement around transportation projects. I, I sense that the it appears at least that the, the movement in place framework is very it's very person centric in terms of it 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 br brings about the idea that streets are used for all different purposes and people experience the space in different ways. And in maybe traditional, more traditional transportation work where the street is the street and everything else exists beyond it, um, it's a bit more disconnected. And so I wonder to Wayne and Andrew, does this connection, very real kind of concrete terms and, and how streets are being used, does that aid in your ability to get out in front of community members and explain why you're doing what you're doing um, to make it make sense? It seems that it would make sense more from a community perspective, but I, I don't know if that's actually the case uh, from your experience. I think a, a lot of people do understand the need to um, think about community well-being, uh, those road users who aren't as protected by vehicles um, as, as um, the ones who are. And I think uh, just the, the wider conversation that happens around safety and, and not accepting um, the road toll uh, like we have previously and starting to actually change that conversation um, a bit more uh, publicly has allowed for that uh, consultation to happen easier. Um, and more people and and you know um covid was a big part of this i, I would say uh it started to get people to think more around um community well-being getting out and about and it actually allowed the rapid change of some of our urban spaces and andrew will know more about this because a lot of it happened in the auckland space um especially in, in the likes of queen street and cpd locations where uh, unlocking footpaths was a key goal when social distancing um, was happening and not many people were out in their vehicles. So uh, I think that actually helped us to have that conversation and people to understand the need a, a bit better as well. I think, um, yeah, I think one thing that we hear from people again and again is why are you doing this? Um, and we are on a journey about explaining why we're doing things. Um, because it used to be that a lot of projects were just happening um, because um, the organization was under pressure to be seen to be doing things. And now we've got a much clearer why behind what we're doing. Um, and that is really, really helpful. Being able to show people, we are digging up your street to do this because this road is important for these reasons. And we have consulted with people on why this road's important. Um, really helps people understand that bigger picture. Um, we had a um, very contentious conversation with the public uh, a year ago around our new parking strategy. And it was very contentious because um, we were out there telling people that on major roads, we can't have half of the space being given for parking. And two thirds of Aucklanders in terms of feedback said, yeah, we get it, we agree. Um, we've got to take parking out of these streets where um, we need it for the movement of people and goods on these these roads. It just makes sense. Um, and so the conversation is getting there and making sense. The trouble is always at the micro level. Um, you can make a change on an individual street and you will have people who are like, but that's my street and I don't want this. And we see this with politicians as well. They, they sign off on the overall big picture thing, but as soon as it's affecting their area, um, it's very difficult. But um, having the why gives us this rationale behind what we're doing because we're spending an awful lot of money. Um, so it, it is very helpful to have all of these tools available. I was on you. I apologize for that. That's a great place to leave it for today. I appreciate those responses. Uh, Jonah, any final words to close us out? Okay. Uh, no, we didn't We didn't get to look at our um, next steps, but to remind everybody, the road safety audit process webinar is on the 23rd, and the speed management webinar is on the 7th. Um, we are also um, getting in front of the AASHTO Safety Summit to talk with a bunch of um, all the state DOTs. That's happening later in the month. Um, and we're going to be looking at ways to get beyond this initial um, 
just kind of sort of communication stage of implementation and into how are we going to change our documents at the federal level, at the state level, um, at the local level, our policies, so that we can actually bring some of this strategy into our operations, not just hear about it, not our heads say that looks nice over there, but make it happen here too. So your ideas um, and participation in that are going to be really important over the next year. So please stay tuned, stay in touch, and, and help us um, bring our, our friends over uh, in spirit. And thanks for joining us very much, Wayne and Andrew. Appreciate it. Yes, thank you for waking up early to bring this to us. Uh, we appreciate it. And please do sign up for parts three and four. They'll be coming on October 23rd and November 7th, respectively. Um, you have the ability to leave us some feedback on today's webinar. I posted a link in the, in the chat. Um, please do that. We we read all those comments and, and Jonah takes them and we work them into the next episode. So if you have any comments for us, um, we really do appreciate those. Um, and we'll see you here next time, October 23rd. Um, have a great day, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, Dan.